the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus, for this beautiful Monday evening that we can spend together in fellowship, diving into your word. And we're so grateful tonight, Lord, to be diving into what is, in essence, one of your home movies, your actual story of your birth. And so we pray, God, that this would come to life for us in a new way, a very familiar story, one that we've heard depicted every year, every Christmas, probably since we've been born, whether we were Christian or not, we hear it and see it portrayed so often. And so we pray, God, that we would receive this with fresh eyes and ears and senses, uh, notice things that we've never noticed before, and above all, allow this to be an opportunity for you once again to speak to us, to speak hope, peace, comfort, promise, and faithfulness into our lives. And as we bring our hearts open and ready before you, we ask that you remove any distractions, worries, anxieties, or fears, anything that may be on our minds or on our hearts that could distract us from hearing your voice tonight. And we pray, God, that you would rebuke those thing, things in your name, the name of Jesus, and that you would come meet us tonight in this place. Let this time be yours, we lay it at your feet. Thy will be done. We pray all of this in your most precious name, Jesus. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We are in Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 38. So, as I said, uh, as I was praying, this is a very, very, very common uh, uh, story in the Gospels. Uh, probably one of the most frequently heard, especially this time of year. And so, uh, what I want to encourage you to do is hear this as if you've never heard it before. I want you to erase every detail that you possibly can in your mind of the who, what, where, when, how, the scene, what people look like, what time of day it is. And I want you to erase that and try and paint it afresh in your mind as you hear this. Um, what I also really like thinking when I listen to this particular account is that Luke, who wrote this, was not one of the 12 apostles. He did not know Mary um, prior to his ministry with Paul. And yet he has this kind of interview account. So he very likely went and interviewed Mary herself, sat down with her and listened to this conversation, this memory of an angel appearing to her and heard this straight from her lips. And I just find that really cool. So if you want to imagine that scene of her telling this to St. Paul, you can do that. Or if you want to imagine this scene as it's being uh, narrated, uh, whatever helps you kind of enter into the story. So uh, if you're just joining us, we are in Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 38. If you're watching this later, welcome. I hope you enjoy it. Uh, open your Bibles and let's read this together. First time through, again, just get an image for what is being said. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a town of Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man named Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And coming to her, he said, Hail, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at what was said and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of David his father. And he will rule over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. But Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I have no relations with a man? And the angel said to her in reply, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month for her who was called barren, for nothing will be impossible for God. 
Mary said, Behold, I am the handmaid of the Lord. May it be done to me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. The Gospel of the Lord. <clears throat> so we're going to read this a second time, as always. This second time through, I invite you to listen more deeply to how the Spirit is speaking to you specifically. Call to mind maybe the things you've been bringing to prayer, what's going on in your own prayer and spiritual life, and allow God to use a word, a phrase, an image from this text to speak directly to you. It might resonate, it might remind you of a particular memory, thought, reflection, question that you've had, um, whatever it may be, just catches your attention it's different than the other words, different than the other verses. Underline those things, circle them, write them down, reflect on why is this standing out to me? What might the Lord be trying to say to me through this? And what might he be compelling me to do? Second time through Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 38. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a town of Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man named Joseph of the house of David and the virgin's name was Mary. And coming to her, he said, Hail, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at what was said, and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of David his father, and he will rule over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. But Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I have no relations with a man? And the angel said to her in reply, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month for her who was called barren, for nothing will be impossible for God. Mary said, Behold, I am the handmaid of the Lord. May it be done unto me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. The Gospel of the Lord. Just take a moment to look that over and see what things stand out to you, what questions this arises within you any reflections that you have or things that you notice that just resonated with you for whatever reason. Uh, and if you want to share those things or ask any of those questions, feel free to do that in the chat or to unmute yourself whenever you feel so inclined and comfortable to share those things. If you're watching this later, feel free to pause or fast forward, share with the people around you that you're watching this with. But for us, take a moment to reflect back on those things that stood out, questions that welled up within you. And as soon as you feel ready, feel free to uh, unmute and share or ask away. I'm asking about verse 32. Mm -hmm. um, the throne of David, his father, that phrase needs explaining to me. I don't know exactly the history. And mm -hmm. the other phrase, um, he shall reign in the house of Jacob forever. Is the house of Jacob the Jews, or is it a wider house that encompasses everybody? I don't know. Mm. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, we'll talk about both of those. Thank you. Question. Um, the words that struck me is... Uh, you have found favor with the Lord, which was said to Mary. Mm -hmm. And that theme, um, in a sense of hope, is, is what struck me that I've tried to live all my life. Um, mm. And uh, to be in God's grace to do that, it just 
came out. <laughs> yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. The word that that struck me was the the phrase will overshadow you. Mm. It, when I hear the word overshadow, I think like forbearing, like it's like this dark cloud is coming over you. And yet, mm. so it's, and so I think a lot of people do that, like have all these, oh, this is gonna be bad. And yet obviously this was a good thing. So maybe, maybe we have to uh, readjust the way we look at things that overshadow us. Mm. Yeah, awesome. Thank you, Faye. Whenever I read this story about Mary, I always think, what would I do if I were in this situation? And I always think like if some angel came, you know, I knew they were angel. I knew they were good. I would be so scared. <laughs> mm -hmm. And, but then reading this, this time, um, the word pondered stood out to me and how Mary, even though she was scared, even though she was troubled, she took the time to kind of think and ponder. And that kind of reminds me that same thing um, when I am faced with something challenging, you know, or if I think that I'm hearing God just to kind of wait and ponder and think about mm -hmm. what has brought, was brought in front of me. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I think those are, that's a great thought just to kind of carry that on and that, that pondering, you know, Mary had to have um, a relationship with God before this. We all know that she was a faithful um, servant, that she had a relationship, but to have him have the angel speak directly to her was probably her first such an encounter. And uh, mm -hmm. um, to say that you have found favor with God and just the whole idea of that, even though I don't anticipate that level of encounter myself um, to just ponder and reflect upon his words to me, whether they're in scripture or just speaking in the silence of prayer um, is really something that we can follow in Mary's example. Mm. I always love the verse at the end of um, when it kind of the end of his childhood where it says she kept all these things in her heart as she kind mm -hmm. of looked at it as he grew up and I think that's our challenge too to keep all these these things in our heart and ponder them and allow them to really to transform us. Mm. Yeah. The phrase that um, that struck me um, is sort of near the end where it's a bit of a flourishment or a, a, an added bonus that you get. So you, you sort of, you were, we were reading the story, right? And it's a factual, right? About angel appearing and Mary thinking and then Mary reacting and asking some questions. And then at the end, Angel Gabriel says, you know, your your cousin Elizabeth or your relative has conceived and it, and it goes on to say, um, for nothing will be impossible for God. That that is a obviously a super powerful statement, but I enjoy it in the context of what is sort of a factual uh, story, and then you have this sort of embellishment, this this flourishment of of that that statement. That's that struck me. Wonderful. Well, if you have more questions or uh, things as we go, please feel free to write them down so we can uh, talk about them at the end or put them in the chat um, in case we don't have time and I can see them as we go. But this is, um, this is a monumental passage here. And so Mary is just one of these figures that all of these things kind of coalesce, all of these themes of the Old Testament, all of these promises coalesce in the person of Mary, just as they do in the person of Jesus. And so there's so many things that could be said about this passage. And so I'm going to do my best to, to uh, have some brevity here. But I, I would encourage you in your own kind of reflection and prayer of this passage, this passage really doesn't make complete sense if you don't read it along with the uh, first part of Luke before it, which is the announcement of the birth of John the Baptist to Zechariah and the comparison between those two, and even going back to 1 Samuel chapters 1 and 2 in the Old Testament and hearing about the pronouncement of Hannah, who's a prefigurement of Mary, who my daughter is named after, um, who is the mother of the prophet Samuel. 
who is a very important figure in the Old Testament, Samuel, and obviously um, his mother, Hannah, who, who wanted this son and wanted to consecrate him to the Lord. Without her, yes, we wouldn't have had Samuel, we wouldn't have had King David, we wouldn't have this big Hebrew dynasty by whose line through which we have the person of Jesus. And so there's this series of kind of um, important encounters with God that all kind of are linked here. So recognize we're, we're kind of looking at this in somewhat of a vacuum because we can't do as much comparison as I would like. We could spend weeks on, on, on that type of thing. So, but a little bit of background here. So the Gospel of Luke was written by Luke, who is a traveling companion of St. Paul. It's believed that he is a, a physician. And so um, he was fascinated with the miracles of Jesus because he was a doctor, um, a you know physical healer himself. And so we see the most miracles appear in uh, the Gospel of Luke. Luke also has a lot of encounters with Gentiles. It really is the gospel to the Gentiles. And it's sometimes also nicknamed the gospel for women because we have all these very important encounters with women and also these very highlighted roles, like um, celebrating the roles that women have in the storyline of Jesus and his lineage and his ministry. And so we see a lot more of that happen in the gospel of Luke than some of the other gospels. Um, and as I said, before this, in the Gospel of Luke, we have the announcement of um, the birth of John the Baptist to Zechariah. And so I'll make some comparisons here. Um, but in general, um, Zechariah was a priest, um, and he was serving in the temple. Him and his wife were barren, uh, his wife Elizabeth, who's a relative of Mary. And the angel Gabriel appears to Zechariah and makes a very similar uh, announcement to him but about John the Baptist and how he would prepare the way uh, of the Lord. And so um, there's a similar um, conversation that happens here. There's kind of verse by verse comparisons that you can do. Um, there's a slightly different outcome for Zechariah. He questions the angel in a different way than Mary does, expressing kind of doubt in the possibility that something like this could happen. And so he is struck mute. And not until um, the birth of his son, and they're looking to name the son, and they're like, oh, we should name him Zechariah after his father. Does he then get his uh, voice back by writing on a tablet, his name shall be John, as the angel proclaimed. And he kind of reverses that doubt that he had by having faith in the message of the angel, and then his tongue is um, unhinged, and he's able to speak once again. So I mention that because the very first verse here in uh, chapter 1, uh, verse 26, says, in the sixth month. So what does that mean? Sixth month of the year? It means in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy. Um, and so it says that in verse 36, this is the sixth month for her who was said to be barren. And so that's what's referring to because that's immediately what was just talked about in the gospel. Now, what's significant about that? Well, um, Zechariah, this is a very kind of obscure fact, but Zechariah was in what is believed to be the Holy of Holies in, in the temple, which you could only enter once a year when he had this uh, inter interaction with the angel. And the day you could enter it is called the Day of Atonement. And that was on or about the fall solstice, on or about September 21st. And if you add six months to that, that's March 21st. And if you add, then that's happening right now. Nine months later, that's on or about December 21st. So, there is some historical factualization that the birth of Jesus actually coincided around the time that we celebrate it. Now, throughout tradition, it has moved around a little bit, but for a very long time, it has been celebrated on December 25th, though it was not always the date we celebrated it. However, scriptural evidence could point to the fact that it is a very accurate time frame for when he was really born um, in the calendar year. So, in the sixth month, that's what that's referring to. The angel... Uh, Gabriel was sent by God. Now we have this also for Zechariah in verse 19, that an angel is sent by God to speak to him. The angel Gabriel is one of seven archangels. Now we only have three of them named in, uh, in our Western tradition and in scripture itself. We have Gabriel, who has a very important role here, communicating this message. Um, that is why he's the patron saint of communications and media, which I find funny. Um, and... Uh, then we have the St. Michael the Archangel, whom we know very well in our tradition, patron saint of police officers, protection from evil, things like that. He's the chief angel, the captain of the army of the angels, uh, victorious over the devil in the book of Revelation. 
And then we have the Ar Archangel Raphael, who appears in the book of Tobit, uh, an Old Testament kind of novella that is a very beautiful story. I um, encourage you to read it if you never have. But in the book of Tobit, we have a mention that there are seven archangels, of whom Raphael is one. And in the Eastern tradition, they actually have names for the other four. Um, sometimes they're disputed. One of them is Uriel, who is believed to be the angel with the fiery sword who guards the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve are kicked out. And then there's three other. I think Ramuel is one of them, and I can never remember the other two because they're kind of pronounced or spelled differently. So no one's really 100% sure between East and West what they agree on in terms of those names. But you can actually buy these like very old, iconic statuettes of all seven archangels, and you see them in some traditional Catholic homes or some Eastern Catholic homes and churches. So that's who Gabriel is. And an archangel basically means a chief angel. Angel means, angelon means messenger. So someone who's sent on behalf of God. That's the, the lowest uh, choir of angels, those who bring messages from God to humanity. They're also the rung of angels by which all of our guardian angels belong. Um, but the archangels are kind of the chief angels. They're the choir right above them. And they're kind of the ones who have the most important messages me messages to send to humanity, most important roles. Uh, so Gabriel is one of those seven. So he's sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth. Now, if you were a Jewish person and you, you know, you're sipping your, uh, I don't know, your tea and someone's reading you this line, you know, and says, um, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel, an archangel, was sent by God to a town of Galilee in Nazareth. You go, what? Like, why? Why would anyone go to Nazareth? Like, that would sound like a joke. Like, God actually spent all this effort to send one of his chief messengers to Nazareth? And we see this elsewhere in, uh, in the Gospels where it says, can anything good come from Nazareth? Nazareth was an, a town in the area of Galilee. It's actually very nearby Cana, where the wedding at Cana happened. Kind of on the uh, southwest of the Sea of Galilee, uh, between the Sea of Galilee and the area of Samaria. And on the other side of Samaria, further south, was the area of Judea, where Jerusalem was. And so it's pretty far north around the Sea of Galilee, um, but not super close to the sea. Nazareth is kind of between the Sea of Galilee and the Mediterranean Sea, kind of in the middle of nowhere. Um, there was no Roman road to this town. It was considered kind of a backwater town. It would never be on any map today had Jesus not been from there. It was a very small outlying village. Uh, maybe 200 people or families maximum lived there at this time. Like it was a podunk, like Hicksville type of town out in the middle of nowhere. And so if you want to pick the least likely, least believable place for the Messiah to come from, it was Nazareth. Um, so, you know, for instance, well, I don't want to tell this story. So, um, a little too, uh, personal for my hometown, but anyway, <laughs> um, uh, I don't want other people who are also from where I grew up to listen and get offended by how we talk about certain parts of where, uh, where I grew up. So anyways, um, but Nazareth was like that kind of place, you know, not, not the, the best place to be from. Um, and so this would have been a very strange beginning to a story here. Um, and it recognizes this, that the angel goes to Zechariah first and announces that they would have John, who would be this messenger. And then he goes to Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. These first two verses. So the angel goes to this prestigious place, the temple, to Zechariah to say this very important thing to a very important person. And then where does he go to pronounce the birth of the Savior, the Messiah? Not Jerusalem, not a temple, not to a priest, not even to a man, not to an elder, not to a wealthy person, not to an educated person, to Mary. That says something about this constant upside down nature of the kingdom of God. We talked about that a lot in last year's cycle with the Gospel of Matthew. Anytime you hear the kingdom of heaven, you always think upside down, not what we would typically believe or glorify in our world. Um, not powerful, not wealthy, not affluent. God always seeks to come to and work through, in profound ways, the lowly, the forgotten, the tossed aside, the neglected, the not very valuable or sought after by cultural normative standards. So the same thing is true here. Verse 27, to a virgin, the word here for virgin is Parthenon, which I find interesting because there's a, a, a monument in, in Athens called the Parthenon. And it's named that because it was a um, it was a temple to the goddess Athena, 
um, for many years. And there was this group um, called the Arep Arepophros, I think. Um, they were a, a group of girls that were 7 to 11 years old, usually, so obviously virgins. And four of them were chosen every year to kind of serve in the temple of Athena for that whole year. Um, so the, it's interesting there. But what's also interesting is in the 6th century um, uh, AD, it became a Christian church dedicated to the Virgin Mary. And then eventually it became a mosque and then kind of trained. And I think now it's just like a historical site or something like that. But it's interesting that a uh, pagan uh, building called the Parthenon, the Greek word for virgin, actually then later became a church dedicated to the virgin of virgins herself, Mary. So I just think that's super cool. But that's that word for a virgin. We see it sometimes listed elsewhere. It obviously means what it's supposed to mean. She has never um, had any encounter with a man, which she talks about the fact later when she's told that she's going to conceive a son. But it says she's engaged, uh, and betrothed, I believe, is, is the word that's in the other uh, translation that we read before. Betrothed was basically, it wasn't like our modern engagement. Okay, so modern engagement, you get engaged, you start planning your wedding, uh, it can be kind of any length of time, you could break off an engagement, like, you know, not, uh, it's a big deal, but not like, you know, the craziest thing to happen. Um, but in Jewish culture, an engagement had this kind of legal binding status. You were considered married when you were betrothed. The only thing that had not yet happened is that you had not yet had the wedding celebration that um, at one point involved the groom, the bridegroom, going to the house of the bride and escorting her back to his home to live with him. And there they would consummate the marriage. And then the families would celebrate that that event had happened and they would have this week-long wedding celebration that these two people had now been joined. And so the, the kind of time of engagement or betrothal was not very long. It was basically the amount of time they needed to secure the dowry, tell everyone that a wedding was happening, plan it, and have it. So because all of this was happening very rapidly, a lot of families were involved, money was involved, um, you know, planning this life together, you were... It was considered, you know, legally married, even though it had not yet um, happened ceremonially yet. So the reason why this is important is because in the Gospel of Matthew, we have this um, story about Joseph where Joseph is mentioned here. That's all we hear about him. But in Matthew, it says Joseph learns of this and seeks to divorce her quietly. He's trying to not get her in trouble because he believes that she'll be um, accused of adultery, and that was a crime uh, punishable by death. You would be stoned to death, typically, for that crime. And if Joseph said, like, she's pregnant and it's obviously not mine, that's a death sentence. And so that's a, it's a heavy yes that Mary says in this passage. And we see that with this kind of legal term that's very clearly written here, because Luke wants you to know this was a very difficult situation to find yourself in. Um, so anyway, she's engaged to a man whose name was Joseph. That's his only mention in the story. But what's important is that it mentions that he is of the house of David. Now, there were prophe uh, prophecies and promises that one who would, the Messiah, the one who would come to save and reconcile the Jewish people to God, who would come and redeem them, who they believed was going to be a great military leader, Messiah, was going to come from the lineage of King David from the Old Testament. And so when you say from the house of David, it means you can trace your bloodline back to David, um, his house, his tribe. That is why um, when Caesar Augustus calls the census and they have to go to Bethlehem, Joseph and Mary go to Bethlehem because that is the city of their birth and it is the city of David. So it shows that that is the city of Joseph's lineage. We have elsewhere, I believe, in the Gospel of Matthew that actually traces both Mary and Joseph's lineage to David somehow. But because Mary is a relative of Elizabeth, Elizabeth and Zechariah are both of priestly class. They're both of the tribe of, uh, well, he's of the tribe of Levi. She de she's a descendant of the first prophet or first priest Aaron, the brother of Moses. Um, she probably, Mary has probably some of that priestly lineage in her as well to the tribe of Levi. Um, which is all very interesting. We have this kingly lineage, this uh, priestly lineage, and then we have this link to the prophet Samuel and Hannah, and who is Jesus but the priest, the prophet, and the king. Um, so all this kind of imagery and typology coming together with this story. So, uh, but that's why House of David is significant, lineage. That's why the genealogy of Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew is so important. 
you might read those first few verses and be like, oh my gosh, this is boring. I don't know who any of these people are. But when we read that, like the Jewish people thought that the, the line of David was gone. They thought it had disappeared. They thought it had been destroyed when they were taken into exile, that they kind of lost their shot. And uh, they believed that a man named Zerubbabel, uh, if you're looking for uh, baby names or future grandkid names, Zerubbabel, great name. Um, he was the one who helped, one of the instrumental uh, people who helped build the second temple in Jerusalem. And he was a uh, in the line of David, but he was believed to be the last known descendant. And so if you're a Jewish person reading that lineage and it says, and he was, uh, and then uh, his son was Zerubbabel, and you'd be like, yeah, I get it. And then you would read, and his son was so-and-so, and his son was so-and-so, you'd be like, wait a minute, what? what, who, what, what's happening? Like you get so excited that all of a sudden you didn't realize that this line of David continued, continued underground or unbeknownst to anyone important and culminated in the person of Jesus. So lineage and pointing back to these Old Testament figures is very important for messianic prophecies and um, messianic typology. So uh, virgin's name was Mary. Verse 28. And he came to her and said, I just want to point out the gravity here that an archangel of God chooses, again, not to come to the Roman emperor, not to come to the high priest, not to come to, you know, whoever to make this announcement and this proclamation through, but just to her, simply Mary as herself. Mary was uh, probably of uh, betrothal age, childbearing age, which at that time was anywhere from 12 to 15 years old. Um, I'm 33 years old, and if an angel appeared in my room, my first uh, instinct would probably be to like, I don't know, wet the bed or something. I'd be so terrified. I don't know like what I would think, you know, and we have this like, we have this hallmark version of the depiction of angels, right? Just like some golden person with like very ripped muscles and two wings. But if you look at the symbolism of angels in scripture, it's like, oh no, they're beings sometimes that are covered with eyes and wings. Like just, a, can you imagine if you woke up in the middle of the night to a ball of eyes flying in your room? Like what, what? Like there, you're, my response would not be like, behold, let it be done to me according to your world. Like, Get out. What are you demon, you know, thing? Like I'd be so terrified. So just that, that this happens to this innocent young girl and she's willing to ponder she's willing to engage she's willing to say yes i think it's just so beautiful and so significant um in, in just how this whole story unfolds in this gospel of luke and his focus on the lowly the uh the unexpected so he comes to her and he says this greetings favored one the lord is with you this is where we get the first lines of the hail mary hail mary full of grace the lord is with you so greetings, favored one. This is a very important apologetic verse in Catholicism. And apologetic doesn't mean we apologize for being Catholic. It means we're defending a certain teaching um, about Catholicism. The words here in Greek are kare ke karatomene, which means one having previously been filled with grace. There's this past conditional tense to the verb. So what that says to Mary and why she's greatly troubled or greatly distressed by that greeting is because the angel is telling her, you have been preserved by grace already. And so in essence, this is kind of our scriptural foundation for the Immaculate Conception. Now, not everything in Catholicism needs a to be found in scripture because we also have sacred tradition. And that's a very important aspect of our faith as well. But this is kind of the scriptural tie-in, the scriptural evidence that we have to also inform what we know from tradition, that, a Mar that Mary was immaculately conceived. That's what we just celebrated in the Holy Day this past week on December 8th, the Feast of the Immaculate Conception of Mary on December 8th, which is why we informally celebrate September 8th as Mary's birthday, um, nine months later after her uh, Immaculate Conception. And so the church teaches that in order for a perfect savior to enter the world, he would need to do so through a perfect womb. And so Mary was believed to be preserved from the stain of original sin from the moment of her conception. We all have the stain of original sin on our soul. It's why we uh, sin. It's why we make mistakes. It's why we're tempted. The only two people in the history of the world who uh, actually the only four people in the history of the world who did not have that are Jesus, Mary, and Adam and Eve before the fall. They did not obviously have original sin, but they brought it into the world and then it tainted their understanding. So 
Um, some people then think that Mary absolutely, you know, obviously would have said yes to the invitation of the angel. But that's not true because Eve was in the same position, right? Eve, no sin existed, no original sin. She was, in a sense, immaculately conceived, but she still had free will. She could still fall into temptation. And so Mary, despite being in this kind of graced state, had to still choose every single day to stay in it. And that shows her discipline. It shows, as Tom pointed out, her pre-existing relationship with God. Who knows how many angels she had seen before? Who knows if this was even a surprising encounter? This may have just been a Wednesday, you know? Like, who knows in the life of the Virgin Mary uh, what this was like? But it's important because this, yes, this particular encounter, it's what Jesus entering the world all hinges upon. Hail, favored one. Hail, one who has been filled with grace. The Lord is with you. That phrase, the Lord is with you, is similar to other phrases that are used when God sends an important person to do an important work. In Exodus, when he sends Moses back to Egypt, he says, I will be with you. In um, the book of Judges, he says this to the judge Gideon. He says this to Jeremiah, the prophet. Um, Where you go, I will, I will be with you where I send you. And so this is uh, a key phrase to show that Mary, despite her lowly status, already being said is a young girl of betrothal age, a virgin um, in this backwater town of Nazareth. God is using the same language for important people of the Old Testament that a Jew would recognize to show how significant this moment is. Verse 29, but she was much perplexed by his words. Zechariah is also very confused in verse 12 um, of the angel's pronouncement to him. Um, Very perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. So it says in other places, greatly troubled. And that's because the angel has told her, you have been filled with grace. And she's like, well, what does that even mean? Um, In fact, the word, um, the words there, kekara tomeni, the, the, Root word is charis in Greek, C-H-A-R-I-S. And that is the word that means grace. And later when it says in a, in a, in a verse or two, you have found favor, that is karin, same root word, C-H-A-R-I-N. Um, but charis, C-H-A-R-I-S, uh, you cannot spell Eucharist without that word. It has that word grace built into Eucharistas, which means Thanksgiving. There's a sense of being filled with grace also when we receive the Eucharist. So um, it's an important word. That is what perplexes her, why she ponders what sort of greeting this might be. And I love that, I believe Lou pointed out that pondering, how important that is. You know, I think, um, I, I don't know about you, but I tend to be very reactive. So if a situation is presented to me, I will then say, okay, how do I solve this? You know, how do I uh, look at the information that's presented to me? What can I offer? And Mary doesn't do that. Mary just receives it. It's confusing to her. But she just takes it, she ponders it. And I think that's a very important lesson for us for Advent, a very important lesson for us for daily Christian life and spiritual practice. How often do you simply just ponder where you are? Are you always trying to get to the next spiritual step, overcome the next spiritual hurdle? Or do you spend time just sitting with God and inviting him to sit with you, pondering where you are, pondering what life has brought you today, pondering how you feel? Um, and just being there in that moment. We live in a very busy-minded culture. Even though we are more isolated and at home, we still busy ourselves with ideas. It's been the whole thing of this, this whole lockdown experience, right? It is kind of this pressure that if you don't escape from lockdown with some new skill, like learning how to bake bread or losing a bunch of weight or having a new hobby, you kind of failed lockdown, right? That's how busy we are as a culture. We always have to be doing the next thing, gaining the next achievement, meeting the next goal. But Mary teaches us that sometimes you just need to sit. Sometimes you just need to be. You don't need to do, just be. And allow God to just be with you in that moment. Which is why I think she's she's called the perfect disciple because she, she models that so perfectly and echoes that in all of the good and bad moments of Jesus's ministry. She was just there. She was with him, took his body down off the cross, with him in his ministry and his healing and beautiful moments, like at the wedding at Cana, and also in the dark and terrible moments. So how do we do that? How do we ponder instead of react? Verse 30, the angel said to her, do not be afraid, says this to Zechariah as well in verse 13, do not be afraid, Mary. This is the, uh, as I've said many times before, the most often repeated phrase in all of scripture. 
do not be afraid, do not fear, be not afraid, reminding us constantly over and over and over and over again that God is with us, that fear need not rule our lives, that God is bigger than any fear, any anxiety that we could possibly have. Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Again, that word favor, karen, meaning grace. You have found grace with God. Um, this is not the person you would expect to find favor with God. Again, you would expect him to say this type of phrase to Zechariah. He does not. He, you would expect him to say, you know, despite his priestly class, um, you know, he says this instead to Mary. You'd expect that of, um, of Zechariah, but no. Uh, we continue, verse 31. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. And the angel says something similar to Zechariah in verse 13. Uh, you will name him John. Uh, gives him the name, tells him that you will have a son in your old age. And so there's setting up this kind of um, tradition here of miraculous births. And if you look back in the tradition of Judaism, um, you have this in uh, Abraham, Abraham when he has Isaac. You know, him and Sarah are barren. Um, and then they're gifted with the birth of, the son, of their son Isaac. You have this with Moses and how he escapes the slaughter of the innocents. Um, and is preserved by uh, being put in a basket of reeds and uh, put in the River Nile next to the area where the Pharaoh's daughter is bathing. Uh, you have this in many different instances, and here is, is no different. Um, same thing with the story of Hannah in 1 Samuel when she has the prophet Samuel. Um, same thing here, same thing with Elizabeth. The miracle for Elizabeth is that she was in old age. Um, not impossible, but unlikely. And then doubles down on that miraculous effect by allowing a virgin to conceive, which is impossible. Last time I checked, I passed biology, so I'm pretty sure that's how it works. So, um, anyway, so um, setting up this kind of miraculous action of God that we're meant to pay attention to. God wouldn't just come speak through an angel to some ordinary person and do this miraculous act for no reason. You know, God is not a God of accidents. He's not just haphazardly throwing miracles out. Everything is for a purpose. And when we look at that kind of ongoing thematic depiction of miraculous births, this language that is ongoing, the Lord is with you, and inciting these lineage names like David and soon Jacob, like all of this is showing that God is playing the long game, that he knows what he's doing. He's not haphazardly like stumbling around up there like, oh man, you know, can you find my grace maker? I totally lost it. You know, or like, you know, he's not like some bumbling idiot up there. Um, and I think sometimes we, we, we don't realize this, but we act like he is. How many of you have ever prayed for the same thing over and over and over again? Yeah. Did God forget? So, like, oh man, thank you so much for reminding me. I'm totally losing it today. Like, no, like it doesn't mean you shouldn't. And he doesn't enjoy your persistence. But prayer is meant to change us. Our persistence turns into discipline and, and persistent trust. He's the same. He's working for our good. He's playing the long game. He knows what he's doing. And that plays out perfect, uh, perfectly here in this story. Um, you will name him Jesus. The name Jesus, um, it's, it's beautiful in the catechism. I don't know what chapter, but I'm sure you could look it up. But it says the name Jesus carries so much power because his name contains his purpose. The name Jesus means God saves. And so there's salvific power. There's grace in his name itself. That he actually, his presence, his power, his purpose dwells in his very name. It says something, a more eloquent uh, version of that in the catechism. Go look it up. So verse 32, uh, he will be great. Angel says this is Zechariah of John the Baptist in verse 15. He will be great. Um, and will be called the Son of the Most High. Now, this obviously he doesn't say to John the Baptist. This is serious. So he's not saying we'll be called a Son of God. We've talked before about how Son of God is a title that is used for a secular authority that can mean Son of God in heaven, but it can also be confused with, you know, like someone like a pharaoh or an emperor. They claimed a divine status, so they called themselves Sons of God. But this is Son of the Most High, who is clearly God the Creator. And so it's a very important designation. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor, David. So that throne, which they believed the line was cut off and would reestablish the kingdom. In the Old Testament, the kind of the glory days of the Jewish people were the, the ages of the Hebrew kingdom. A span of about 80 years, 
I believe from about 1050 BC to about 930 BC. And you had the kings Saul, David, and Solomon. And then more kings persisted after that. But about 930 BC, there was a civil war and a split between north and south. And they had very corrupt kings. They were constantly at war with each other. And then eventually the Assyrians and the Babylonians come in and they wipe them out, destroy the temple, take them all into exile. And so the really good kingdom time was just like Saul, David, and Solomon. Solomon taxed everyone to build the temple. And Saul was kind of a corrupt, proud king who tried to kill David. And so David is kind of like the favorite. He's uh, just a very revered kind of priestly king figure in the Old Testament. And so we've talked before about how important Moses and Elijah are. Third on that list for the Jewish people, King David. Absolutely. So anytime you hear those names, think very important, very mess messianic prophecy oriented. Um, this would get the Jewish people super excited. Um, and I think it's also important to point out here um, a very important theological reality about Mary, that Mary is called the new Ark of the Covenant. If you don't remember this, the Ark of the Covenant uh, is from Indiana Jones. Obviously, um, Dr. Jones found it. It's in a warehouse somewhere in Area 51. But before that, it was, um, it was in the Old Testament. It was the uh, container in which held the Ten Commandments, the manna from the desert, and the rod of Aaron. Um, so symbols of the uh, kingly office, the priestly office, and the prophetic offices of Jesus. It held power. It led the Hebrew people to military victories. It's this unfathomably powerful artifact that has never been found. Um, the last we hear of it, the prophet Jeremiah seals it up in a cave to protect it from impending invasion. But David uh, dances before the Ark of the Covenant, just in many ways as John the Baptist dances in his womb before the Ark in Mary and what she contains, who she contains, I should say. But one interesting, really, thing, uh, really interesting thing that I came across in researching this episode is that um, the, the Ark of the Covenant dwelled in the Holy of Holies, where Zechariah was. Now, the Ark had been lost at this point, but that was where it dwelled. And David had it in his temple. He had the Ark of the Covenant there. And when he committed his big, bad boo-boo sin, when he committed adultery with Bathsheba and had her husband killed in battle, um, he repented for a long time, and he actually sent the Ark of the Covenant for three months to a shrine in the hill country of Judea. Where does Mary go for about three months? The hill country of Judea. She goes there as the new Ark of the Covenant. This is one of her titles in Greek, Theotokos, God-bearer, that she is the new Ark containing the manna in the desert, which is the bread of life, the rod of Aaron, the high priest, and the uh, Ten Commandments, the new law in the person of Jesus himself, the Word made flesh. So that is a very important kind of theological cool fact about Mary, that she's called the new Ark of the Covenant. Um, and it's interesting also that Jeremiah seals the Ark up into a cave, and where is Jesus born? But in a cave, a cave stable outside of Bethlehem. So anyways, I could nerd out on that forever. But um, so David is important there because it, it not only reminds us of temple imagery, it also reminds us of the Ark of the Covenant and the glorious kingdom days of the Jewish people in the Old Testament. He will reign over the house, this is verse 33, he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. Jacob was the grandson of Abraham, who's considered the father of faith. Uh, our Islam brothers and sisters, our Protestant brothers and sisters, our Jewish brothers and sisters, and Catholics all can trace their lineage, their spiritual lineage, back to Abraham. And they all revere him as a father of the faith. And so Abraham had uh, Isaac, and Isaac had two sons named Jacob and Esau. Jacob was younger, but he tricked Esau out of his birthright. And so remember this upside down. The oldest did not get the blessing, but the youngest did. And he has this moment when he wrestles with God, and God changes his name to Israel. And from that point on, the Jewish people are called the Israelites, the followers of Jacob. And Jacob has 12 sons, who then we have the names of the 12 original tribes of Israel coming from. So Israel as a nation has its foundation in the person of Jacob. Uh, and so he will reign over the house of Jacob basically means he will rule over all of Israel, all of the tribes, all of the promise, all of the faithful works of God in calling together a chosen people that have led to Jesus in the first place. So Jacob is a very important figure in the Old Testament as well as consider one of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, uh, the four patriarchs uh, you can read about in the book of Genesis chapters 
12 to 50. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. So not like the Davidic kingdom that ended, the, you know, secular kingdoms that end, this will be eternal. Verse 34, Mary said to the angel, Zechariah also replies, verse 18, uh, but Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I am a virgin? Now, Zechariah questions the angel as well, but he is an old priest. He has the gift of years, the gift of education. He's supposed to be very devout, devout, and his question is more one based in doubt. Like, how is this even possible? Mary is one that's just kind of a question of confusion. Like, well, I know how babies are made, and that hasn't happened, so can you explain this to me? Like, she's just looking for a little clarification here. Um, but, Ze but Zechariah is in deep doubt, even as a priest, and that is why he kind of has this punishment, but then Mary is glorified. She doesn't even question that this is possible. She's just wondering how it's going to come to pass. You know, like, do you need to do something first? Like, well, how is, do I go be with Joseph? Like, tell me, you know, give me some instructions here. Where's the manual? She's, like, ready to go, you know? She's ready for this yes to happen. Um, that's why there's a difference here in the reaction from the angel. How can this be since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy. He will be called the Son of God. Pay attention to this verse. We have mentioned here the Holy Spirit. We've mentioned here the Most High, which is God the Father. And we've mentioned here Son of God, Jesus. The whole Trinity present here in this verse with Mary. Mary's also the perfect disciple because she teaches us perfect relationship with each person of the Trinity. She's the perfectly obedient daughter of God the Father, the perfectly devout and um, devoted mother of God the Son, and the perfect spouse of the Holy Spirit. So she's our example of how to encounter and be in relationship with God in all of his three persons. Um, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. The word there for overshadow is episkiazo. And as Faye pointed out, this has a negative connotation for us in English, but in the Greek, this is the same word that is used um, at the transfiguration for Jesus, when the clouds come and he appears dazzling white. So instead of this kind of dark shadow, it's almost like you're, you're overwhelmed with light, like imagining almost like a light shadow. It's something we can't even fathom, that light be so bright that it completely covers and overshadows us, envelops us. Um, this word is also used in Acts chapter 5, describing Peter. When people, when his shadow falls upon people and they are healed. Um, and so this obviously always has to do with the working of the Holy Spirit, not a negative connotation. Um, there's also no use of this that implies any kind of sexual connotation either. That like there was some kind of interaction with Mary and the Holy Spirit. That's not what happened. This was a miraculous intervention on the part of the Holy Spirit and just kind of the glory of God manifesting in the womb of Mary. So um, he will be called the Son of God. Oh, it says the child to be born will be holy. Holy means set apart. Um, if you, um, you know, didn't know that. So it means set apart. So he will be different. He will not be like everyone else, obviously. I mean, he will be called the son of God. Um, verse 36. And now um, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. Now, often uh, Elizabeth is called a cousin. We actually, that uh, word is actually in the King James Version that sometimes is adopted in some Catholic translations. The word uh, sugenis is actually just means a relative. So we actually don't know. It could be more distant than cousin. But they were related. They had a, a kinship. They were um, familial in some sense. Um, and this is the sixth month for her who was said to be barren. Now, there was no kind of like birth announcements at this time. You know, you didn't get like so-and-so is expecting. Here's when the baby shower is. You know, unless you lived in that town, you probably weren't even aware. And so when Mary goes to the hill country to help Elizabeth, she knows already that something miraculous has happened, that an angel has come to her, because how else would she have known to make this big trek out to hill country to help her in her pregnancy? Um, and then lastly, 37 and 38, for nothing will be impossible for God. What a beautiful reminder during this time. Um, I love this verse so much that it is tattooed to my arm with a picture of the Virgin Mary. Um, and so if you've ever wondered what that weird thing on my arm is, it's Mary. Praying the rosary, which is a little conceited, but I got this before I was a very well-formed Catholic. Um, but it says here, upside down, Luke 137. It's meant to be looked at like this, but I can't show you in the, in the camera. So next time I see you in person, take a peek. Um, for nothing will be impossible for God. Love that verse. Something we should all live our lives by. We should always be people of hope. People recklessly 
trusting in the impossibility that God can do in our life. Verse 38, then Mary said, here I am, the servant of the Lord. Let it be, uh, let it be with me according to your word. And that is called Mary's fiat, her yes. Then the angel departed from her. So I think this passage uh, reminds me, at least in the coming weeks, to ponder, to not be reactive, but always to lean into, in those moments of pondering, God is with me. Nothing is impossible for him. And if I simply put myself in a position to see, to say, yes, miraculous, incredible things can happen in my life and the lives of others. So I pray that you will say whatever small miraculous yeses you need to each and every day to trust the Lord more deeply. That's all I have for you this evening. It is 830. Sorry for going so close to the end. Um, one of these days we'll have some time for questions at the end. Um, but let us pray. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Jesus, thank you. Thank you for coming to us um, in such a miraculous way through your mother, through um, what we remember in this season as something that could seem so impossible and yet so simple for you. And so in times like this where things may be seen for us so impossible, help us be reminded that we can trust in you because it's simple for you. You can fix anything that you choose. And so help us to ponder where we are and what you are doing in our lives to not just be reactive, but to allow you to just sit with us in this place and be your children, be your beloved. And in that, we will be saying yes, small yeses each and every day to who you are calling us to be. Bless us in that and all the things that we need in this coming week. We ask all this in your most precious name, Jesus. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you.